chapter 2, Ruth chapter 2, I have a word from the Lord today for somebody in this place. I was all prepared to uh, share a Father's Day message this weekend, and a couple of days ago, the Holy Spirit started to lead me in a different direction. And so, you know, when the Holy Spirit, when he goes to the left, we go to the left. And when he goes to the right, we go to the right. And I said, I'm just going to go with you, Holy Spirit. And he started to download this word to me about what to do when you need an open door. And there's a sense of urgency in my spirit because I believe that God is about to open a divine door of opportunity for somebody. And it's imperative that you receive this word so that you're ready to catch it. So, for the person that the Holy Spirit wants to encourage today, please, listen up. For the rest of you, please, feel free to listen in. On Father's Day 2013, we're going to talk about a woman. We're going to talk about an old woman, a widow, a bitter old widow named Naomi and her better-than-life daughter-in-law, Ruth. And in their story, there's a word about what to do when you need an open door in life. Look with me at Ruth chapter 2 and beginning in verse 1. It says, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the family of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I might find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, I want you to say those words with me this morning, as it turned out, come on, say it again, as it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the family of Elimelech. Just then, would you say those words with me? Just then. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, whose young woman is that? The foreman replied, she is the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field and she has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short break. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we are your sons and daughters by the grace of Jesus Christ. What manner of love is this that we should be called the children of God? Thank you that you have sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts by which we cry out to you, dear Father. Father, I pray that you would come and release to your people that which is needed. Breathe life into us by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to give you a principle of the kingdom this morning that is pure gold. This is a principle that you can take to the bank. When God wants to bless you, he presents you with an opportunity to serve. When God wants to provide for you, he presents you with an opportunity to give out of your own need, sometimes out of your desperation. Elijah told a widow in Zarephath, use your last cup of flour, use your last drop of oil to bake a cake for me first, and then watch and see what our great God will do. When God wants to promote you, he presents you with an opportunity to bow low and to serve someone else. It's the way of the kingdom. In God's kingdom, the way up is down. The path to greatness is servanthood. The key to glory is suffering. The road to the palace travels through pastures and pits and prisons and prickly places. One of the great Bible examples of promotion through humility is Ruth. From a beggar, 
picking through the stubble of Boaz's fields, Ruth advanced in the harvest until she became the owner's wife, the lady of the manor, and the grandmother of King David. And as I look at her story, I find three things to do when you need an open door. Three things to do when you need an open door. First of all, stick with God's people. Stick with God's people. No matter what, stick with His people. Stick by God's people even when it appears that God hasn't stuck by you. Even if a famine has come your way. Even if you've suffered unspeakable losses, even if your heart is broken, even if you can see no hope for the future, even if you can see no way out, stick with God. Stick with God's people, even if some of them don't stick with Him. Even if some lose heart along the way. Even if some begin to doubt his goodness, even if some begin to blame God for their troubles, even if some turn towards Moab, you stick with God. Stick with God's people, even if those who first introduced you to him haven't stuck around. Even if they leave you, even if you lose their friendship and their fellowship, even if you must finish your journey without them, you stick with God. The key word to the book of Ruth, the key message of the book of Ruth is faithfulness. Naomi was about to get a major life lesson in faithfulness. God was about to use two very unlikely people to teach Naomi that his faithfulness is greater than our failures. When you need an open door, stick with God's people Don't move away from the house of bread and praise. Don't move away from the family of God. A famine broke out, and Elimelech and Naomi made the devastating decision to pack up their two boys and to move to Moab. Everyone else in Bethlehem stayed put, but they panicked. Everyone else remained calm and carried on, but they overreacted. Everyone else waited to see what would happen, but they jumped the gun. Bethlehem was the house of praise. Judah was the land, uh, 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 Bethlehem was the house of bread. Judah was the, the land of praise. It's the home of God's family. It was the home of their family. But at the first sign of trouble, they cut and they ran. They decided to try their luck out there in the secular economy rather than to stay put and trust God's economy. They decided to live like lone rangers among strangers rather than to hang tight with God's family. I've been walking with the Lord for 38 years now. And how many times have I seen believers make that same disastrous mistake? The first sign of trouble... At the first sign of conflict or controversy, at the first sign of pressure, they cut and they run. They overreact and they run away from the church. This is the house of praise. This is the house of bread. This is where the living presence of God may be found. This is where his living words are spoken. This is the home of God's family, the greatest people on earth. When troubles come your way, don't run away. This is the place to stay. Looking at Naomi, I find six things that happen when you move away from the house of bread and praise. When you move away from the house of bread and praise, you move away from God's physical provision and his sustaining presence. Bread represents God's provision of our material needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Bread is what sustains us. Bread is a symbol of God's presence that sustains us day by day in every way. Sometimes we come into a season when those things are in short supply and it's difficult, but stay put. Beloved, famines are only temporary. 
It says, and it came to pass that there was a famine. Famines come and then they pass. I have a word of hope for someone today. This famine that you're experiencing, it will pass. His anger only lasts for a moment, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. Weeping only lasts for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Our afflictions are light and momentary and not worth comparing to the eternal weight of glory that God is working in us. Don't you run away. This famine will pass. When you move away from the house of bread and praise, you put your whole family on the wrong trajectory. Elimelech and Naomi made the tragic decision to raise their sons outside of the embrace of God's family. They raised their sons in a thoroughly secular environment, and when their sons came of age, they married unbelieving wives. What accomplishments in life matter if your kids don't know Jesus? What does it matter if they become doctors but they don't possess eternal life? What does it matter if they become lawyers, but they stand condemned on that great and final day of the Lord? What does it matter if they're overachievers in this life, but they're not overcomers in Christ? What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world, but lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? On that last day, you cannot trade in your Porsche and your Rolex for a ticket into eternal life. The name Malon, one of their sons, means sickly. The name Kilion, their other son, means wasted. And that was the trajectory of their family, sick and wasted. Elimelech died prematurely, and then both of his boys died prematurely without leaving any legacy behind them. God's plan for their lives was cut short because they left the house of bread and praise. When you move away from the house of bread and praise, you become barren. Elimelech and Naomi were Ephrathites. That means fruitful. The word Ephrathite means fruitful. That was what their destiny was. But their lives had become anything but fruitful. Another key word in the book of Ruth is the word empty. And because she moved away from the house of bread and praise, she reached a place in life where she was totally emptied out. The same happens when we move away from the house of bread and praise. We become spiritually empty too. We stop bearing fruit for the Lord in our lives. We stop bearing fruit in our character. We stop giving birth to ministries and giving birth to spiritual children that God intended. When you move away from the house of bread and praise, you push your friends away from you. When you move away from God's family, You push away the people that you need the most. You push away the people who are committed to you. You push away the people who God placed in your life as your safety net. You push away the people that are able to help you with their prayers, with their uh, fellowship, with their counsel, with their accountability. Three times on the road back to Bethlehem, Naomi pushed her daughters-in-law away from her. When she finally arrived back home again, she repelled the people of the town. When you move away from the house of bread and praise, something will take over your character where you just repel people and push them away from you. When you move away from the house of bread and praise, you will stay away much longer than you expected. When Elimelech and Naomi left Bethlehem, they only intended to stay away for a little while, the Bible says. But before they knew it, half of a lifetime had passed by. Their boys had grown from children into men. They married and ten more years of married life passed by. Truth is, Naomi would have never gone home again were it not for the tragedies that came into her life. We've seen it happen so many times. People get hurt. They get confused, they get discouraged, and they pull away from the church. And they only intend to take a break for a little while. But before they know it, half a lifetime has passed by, and they still haven't come home. When you move away from the house of bread and praise, 
bitterness becomes your identity. When you leave the place of joyful praise, the place of God's sustaining presence of his word, bitterness comes and fills that empty void. Naomi was overtaken with bitterness. Her spirit became bitter. Her thinking became bitter. Her outlook became bitter. Her tongue became bitter. Her name, Naomi, means pleasant. But she told everyone when she got home, she said, don't you call me pleasant anymore. From now on, call me Mara, which means bitter. Beloved, listen, when you don't stick with God, you end up stuck in life. And that's precisely where Naomi was. When you need an open door, don't move away from the house of bread and praise. And if you have, find the road that will bring you home. With all of the bad decisions Naomi made, she finally made a good one. When she heard that the Lord had come to the aid of his people, she set out on the road that would bring her back to the house of bread and praise. You know, it takes humility. It takes humility to come home a little grayer. It takes humility to come home a little weaker, a little worse for the wear takes humility to come home and to admit that perhaps you should have never gone away from home to begin with. Most people never muster that courage. Indeed, Ruth, uh, Naomi wouldn't have, but sheer desperation drove her back home again. That's all right. Whatever it takes. In the words of Alita Adams, I don't care how you get there, just get there if you can. What most people don't realize is how badly they've been missed and how gladly everyone will welcome them home again. A scolding isn't waiting for you. A celebration is waiting for you when you come home to Father's house. In contrast to Naomi was faithful Ruth. Naomi was a believer who decided not to stick with God and became stuck. Ruth was an unbeliever who decided to stick with God and she became unstuck. Beloved, the door to her future and the door to your future will be found when you find the house of bread and praise. Three things that you need to do when you need an open door. Stick with the people of God. And secondly, find an opportunity to serve and serve with all your might. Find an opportunity to serve and serve with all your might. Beloved, listen, there is an important key in the book of Ruth that we must not miss. Ruth believed that her situation could change. She believed that her situation would change, but she did not let her faith paralyze her. We talk a lot about being paralyzed by fear, but I observe that sometimes we can be paralyzed by faith. We can have so much hope that a major change is coming someday that we overlook the little opportunities to initiate change that are right under our noses today. Thomas Edison was right when he said opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and it looks like work. <laughs> Ruth took initiative. She found the one and only option that was available to her, and that was to go into a field and, like a beggar, pick through the stubble behind the harvesters. It was the only door available, so she rolled up her sleeves, and she jumped into that field, and she gleaned like a fiend. As I talk and I pray with people, I find more and more that they have mindsets that lend itself to getting stuck. They're not willing to consider an opportunity that is available to them today because it's far less grand than what they dream about doing someday. When I was 19, God called me very clearly to be a senior pastor. But that didn't happen for 13 more years. And in between, I, I did a lot of jobs that weren't my ultimate calling, but each one of them was important to getting me to where I needed to be. I was a worship leader. I helped plant a church, first as a student and then as an intern. I taught Sunday school. I taught Bible studies. I was a youth pastor for one year. 
I was the most uncool youth pastor in the history of youth pastoring. Listen, sometimes in ministry, you do trial and error, and you, it's like by elimination. You know what is not your calling. Youth was not my calling. Jesus, help us, Father God. I was a college and career pastor. I was an assistant pastor. I was an interim pastor at a tiny church in the Ozark Mountains that was built in the early 1800s and was heated by a wood stove. It was like little house on the prairie for crying out loud. I was an employee at the Assemblies of God headquarters. I was also a bus boy. I was a stock boy. I was a cashier. I was a shoe salesman. Hey, I was the number one shoe salesman in Macy's in 1985. I was a shipping clerk, I was a delivery man, an office worker, and half a dozen other things. Beloved, listen to me. May God give you grace. When you need an open door, don't waste your energy worrying about what you cannot do yet. Find an open door to serve and serve with all of your might. What happens when you serve with all of your might? You sow seeds for your own future success. When God wants to bless you, he presents you with an opportunity to serve. When God wanted to bless Rebecca with a loving and a rich husband, when he wanted to bless her with a place of honor in salvation history, he gave Rebecca the opportunity to water Eliezer's camels. When God wanted to bless Jacob with a family and vast wealth, he gave Jacob the opportunity to serve his uncle Laban. When God wanted to bless Joseph with authority over all the land of Egypt and an open door to save his family, he gave Joseph the opportunity to serve Potiphar and then a prison warden and then the Pharaoh. When God wanted to bless Moses with a refuge in the wilderness, he gave Moses the opportunity to serve Jethro's daughters. When he wanted to bless Joshua with the top leadership post in the nation, he gave Joshua the opportunity to serve Moses. When God wanted to bless David to become the next king of Israel, he blessed him with the opportunity to serve the first king of Israel. When God wanted to bless Elisha with the top prophetic office in the nation, he gave Elisha the opportunity to serve Elijah when God wanted to bless Peter with a net breaking boat sinking catch of fish he gave Peter the opportunity to serve Jesus when God wanted to bless Luke with the privilege of writing one quarter of the New Testament he blessed him with the opportunity to serve the Apostle Paul it's the way of the kingdom it's the way it has always been in God's economy, and it shall always be. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Don't turn your nose up at the opportunity to do some humbling or menial task when God is with you. Those opportunities turn into divine open doors. The wisdom of the world says don't waste your time on things that don't take you directly toward your goals. Don't stoop to take assignments that are beneath your education or your experience. But the wisdom of the word says that God's humbling detours are the pathway that lead to his divine open doors. Jesus said after you have served faithfully with what belongs to another man, then God will give you your own to manage. What happens when you serve with all of your might? When you serve with all of your might, you open doors for as it turned out and just thens to happen. This is a good preaching right here. I'm about to make myself happy. It's coming. You better fasten your seatbelt. Ruth took advantage of the only opportunity that was available to her. And she went into that field and she started to glean. And as it turned out, she just happened to pick the field that belonged to Boaz, the only man who could help her. And while she was gleaning like a fiend, just then, Boaz came and noticed her. Beloved, listen to me. When you accept God's opportunities to serve and you serve with all your might as it turned out and just thens begin happening for you. I moved to Springfield, Missouri to start graduate school with $500 to my name. That was 
all I had. As it turned out, shortly after I arrived, the seminary was hosting a major conference of Pentecostal scholars. And they were looking for student volunteers to man the front door of the seminary and to let the conference participants in and out of the locked doors. Denise was on the student government committee and she was in charge of recruiting the student volunteers to man the door and I was gaga about Denise so I agreed to do it for the whole week. I stood at that dumb door from early in the morning till late at night every day for a week and I let the conference participants in and out of the door with a smile. I missed the whole conference. I missed Gordon Fee. I missed Vincent Sinan. I missed Harvey Cox. I missed all of the great minds, Pentecostal minds and scholars of the day. But as it turned out, the academic dean's secretary was looking to hire a student for a part-time job. And she noticed me standing there at that dumb door every day for a week from early in the morning till late at night. And I don't know whether she admired me or whether she pitied me, but she offered me the job in the dean's office. I started answering phones and filing, but just then the assistant to the director of extension education got her green light to leave for the mission field. And she too noticed me standing there at that door every day from early in the morning till late at night letting people in and she came to me and she said, Glenn, I think you should apply for my job. I did apply and I worked for Dr. Gary, Dr. Gary Kellner for four years. And as it turned out, one of Dr. Gary Kellner's best friends was Dr. Paul Wood, whose brother, Dr. Jim Wood, was a member here at Harvest Time Church. As I was finishing my last year of seminary, Denise and I began praying that the Lord would open a door of ministry in a local church. And just then, Dr. Jim Wood called Dr. Paul Wood and said, our church is looking to hire a seminary graduate for an associate pastor. I don't know whether Dr. Paul Wood admired me or whether he pitied me for surviving four years under Gary Kellner. But he came into my office one night and he said to me, I know where you belong. We came here in 1996 and as it turned out, Pastor Tate was looking for someone to groom to take his place as the next senior pastor of harvest time. And there have been many, many as it turned outs and just thens that have followed. Our friend Pat Rich helped Denise to find a part-time job at Town Hall. And as it turned out, Denise ended up working full-time for the town planner. And just then, Harvest Time Church found this piece of property to buy. But 22 other people had tried to buy it ahead of us and the town planner blocked every purchase. But as it turned out, we were able to meet with the town planner and she supported our proposal to build a church here. Some other would-be buyers were jealous and so they began to stir up trouble in town. They wrote a horrific letter about the church and circulated it all over town and people began to call into the town planner's office objecting to our zoning application but just then Denise was the person that was picking up all of the telephone calls. And the town planner gave her permission to tell the callers that the information in the letter was not accurate. At the end of one of the phone calls, one of the callers said to Denise, if I didn't know better, I'd swear you were working for that church. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. When you're walking with Jesus and you find an opportunity to serve and you do it with all your might, all of a sudden, as it turned out and just then begin happening, receive an encouraging word from the Holy Spirit. 
as it turned out and just then is waiting for you. Supernatural serendipity is waiting for you. Divine appointments are waiting for you. Chance encounters that are not chance at all are waiting for you. New jobs are waiting for you. Promotions are waiting for you. New relationships are waiting for you. Open doors of blessing are waiting for you. Come on, give Jesus some praise. And the key to opening those doors is to find a God-given opportunity to serve and to do it with all of your might. What happens when you serve with all of your might? When you serve with all of your might, you attract people of noble character to you. Boaz was a man of noble character. He was strong. He was capable. He was wise. He was self-controlled. He was disciplined. He was a good manager. He was a good leader. He was a good provider. Listen, my sisters who are waiting, you hold out for your Boaz to come. God's going to give you a man who's a man of noble character. He's not going to give you some video game playing, chip eating, couch potato loser. He's going to give you a Boaz. He's going to give you a man of good character. Ruth, you listen to me. Don't you settle for any. You can hook up with any loser. Don't you listen to me. You hold out for your Boaz. Boaz, you hold out for your Ruth. When you serve with all of your might, you attract people. That's a good word right there. Listen, this is a a marriage season. I, I speak it right now. A marriage season is coming on harvest time. Boazes are going to find their Ruths, and Ruths are going to find their Boazes. You better lose that loser that you've been dragging around with you. Let go of that person who's got no aspirations because God's, you you know, God can't bring, I don't know, I'm off, um, it's always dangerous when I go off track. Listen to me. God cannot, God cannot bring the best that he has for you into your life when something less is in the way. So get rid of what's less in the way. Listen, don't you settle for anything less than a spouse who is sloppy in love with Jesus, who is living pure and clean for the Lord, who's on fire for Christ, who's going places. Mm, I believe that God's about to bring some Boazes to some Ruths, and some Ruths to some Boazes. Mm, I like it. I have, to, I have to tell you the truth. I'm getting a little old, so weddings, seriously, they're like a lot of work for me. So ask Pastor Nick, all right, Pastor Faith, Pastor Kevin, they can marry you. We have, we have a whole staff of people. We'll just, we'll just make this into a wedding, a, a Boaz and Ruth wedding chapel, but ask, ask one of the other staff pastors to marry you. <laughs> Ruth gleaned like a fiend, and Boaz noticed her. To give you an idea of how hard she worked, at the end of the first day, she took home about two-thirds of a bushel of grain. That's about 40 pounds of grain. And, and think about it with me. She didn't just walk into Trader Joe's and, you know, and lift up a 50-pound sack on her shoulder. She had to go through the field. She had to find the stalks that were left behind after the harvest, find the ones that had a little bit of grain on them, thresh that grain out of those empty stalks, collect it, and carry it home. To give you a little perspective, the average laborer, was paid two pounds of grain a day for his day's work. On the first day, Ruth brought home 20 times more than any man in the field. And that attracted Boaz. When you serve with all of your might, people of noble character are going to be attracted to you. Beloved, listen, receive this encouraging word from the Lord today. Some men of noble character are going to notice you. 
They're going to make inquiries about you. God is going to arrange it so that they hear good words about you. They're going to have favor on you. They're going to protect you. They're going to create new positions in their organizations just to accommodate you. They're going to promote you over the heads of those who were once over you. They're going to want to hold on to you and not lose you, not let go of you. They're going to open up streams of provision for you. Boaz told his men, let her work alongside of you. Don't you dare touch her. Don't you catcall to her. Don't you look at her cross-eyed and you leave her plenty of grain on purpose. On the first day, Ruth brought home about three weeks worth of provision. She worked through the barley harvest and then through the wheat harvest. At that rate, at the end of two and a half months, she brought home enough provision to care for Naomi and herself for more than a year. I believe there's a specific word for somebody in this place today. God is about to do something big and a year's worth of income is about to come raining down on you in the next two and a half months. Give the Lord a big praise if you're ready to receive that. Three things to do when you need an open door. Finally this. Don't give up sticking and serving until your miracle comes. Melissa, you can help me. Worship team, you can help me. Don't you give up. Don't you quit. Don't you get tired. Don't you get weary. Refresh yourself. Encourage yourself in the grace and the goodness of the Lord. Don't give up in spite of whatever hardships you might face in the field. Don't have time to elaborate. But in Boaz's dialogue with the foreman, we learned that there was a little trouble in the field. Apparently, Ruth went to get a drink of water, and the workers gave her a hard time. They catcalled to her. They were harassing her, made her uncomfortable. Ruth was about to pack it in and go off to another field. But Boaz begged her to stay. And then he told his men, don't you dare disrespect her. Don't you dare touch her and draw as much water for her as she needs through the day. Beloved, listen to me. I feel real specific for somebody. If someone is giving you a hard time in the workplace, if someone, if there's inner office politics going on and someone's trying to blackball you, somebody's trying to push you aside or, or overstep you, I want to tell you, don't you quit. God is going to raise up a Boaz for you who's going to spread the corner of his garment over you and protect you. Don't you give up no matter what hardships you might face in the field. And don't you give up, even though it looks like you're not getting any closer to your dreams. Ruth gleamed like a fiend for two and a half months. And finally her miracle came at harvest time. One enchanted evening, she went to the threshing floor and Boaz proposed to her, and the beggar girl who once picked through the stubble of the field now became married to the Lord of the harvest. And she took her place in salvation history as the grandmother of great King David and one of the four women honored in the genealogy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Beloved, receive an encouraging word from the Lord this morning. Don't be weary in doing good, for in due season you shall reap if you don't quit. Therefore, take every opportunity to do good to all men, and especially those who belong to the family of God. What to do when you need an open door? Stick with the people of God. Find an opportunity to serve and do it with all of your might. And don't you quit serving and sticking until your miracle 
comes through. Stand on your feet and give Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place. Oh, come on, let's give him a big praise. Come on, let's give him a big praise. Come on, let's give him a big praise in this place. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on, just say the name of Jesus with me, would you? Come on, let's lift up the name of Jesus. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, we magnify you. Jesus, we exalt you. Jesus, we glorify you. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up your voice. Better is one day. Come on, give Jesus a big praise in this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, O Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Open doors, open doors, open doors, open doors, open doors, open doors. Lift up your hands. I want to bless you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless the people of God. I bless the sheep of your hand. I bless the people of your inheritance. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless your people, God, for supernatural serendipity. I bless your people, Lord, for divine appointments. I bless your people for chance encounters that are not by chance at all, but by, that are by the providential hand of God. I bless your people for promotions. I bless your people for bonuses. I bless your people, Lord God, for in Increase. I bless your people, Lord, for new jobs and new opportunities. I bless your people for new relationships. I bless Ruth's for Boaz's, and I bless Boaz's for Ruth's, God. I thank you, Lord, for a quickening of inner character, of inner man, Lord, that makes us the kind of noble man that draws noble women to us, or the noble kind of woman that draws noble men to us. Father, in Jesus' name, I bless your people. God, for three weeks provision in one day and, for, two and for, for a year's provision in two and a half months. Father, I pray. Take your hands if you would, and it's just symbolic and voluntary, but if you would, would you put your hands over your eyes? Father, right now in Jesus' name, I pray, God, that you would give us eyes to see divine opportunities to serve. Father, I pray that you'd give us eyes to see, Lord, the opportunity to water Eliezer's camels. God, give us eyes to see the opportunity to defend Jethro's daughters. God, give us eyes to see the opportunity to interpret dreams, Lord, that get back to the ears of the Pharaoh. God, give us eyes to see the opportunities, Lord, to bend over, Lord, and to pick grain out of the fields, Lord. Give us eyes to see those opportunities to hold doors open for people that lead to your open doors. Come on, take your hands, lift them up to the Lord if you would. Symbolic and voluntary, but if you would, lift your hands. God, I pray that you would anoint our hands to serve with all diligence. God, I pray that whatever our hand finds to do, that God, we would do it with all of our might, that whatever our hands finds to do, that we would do it with all diligence as unto the Lord. I pray that you would bless our hands for industry. I pray that you would bless our hands for productivity, oh God. I pray that your people would be the most valuable employees in their company, that they would be the most valuable employees in their firm, Lord, that they would be their most valuable employees in their division. Lord, I pray that your people would be the top shoe salesmen, Lord. God, at whatever you've given their hand to do, Lord. Father, I pray, God, that we would be highly valued by our employers. Lord, I pray that they would make a bid for us, that they would want to hold on to us. Lord, that they would create special positions just to accommodate us. Lord, I pray that you'd promote your people over the heads of those that were once over them. Father, I ask in Jesus' name, 
Lord, let us be as valuable as Daniel was to the king. Let us be as valuable as Joseph was to the Pharaoh. Lord, Father, let that gift of wisdom that rested on them, Lord, for problem solving, to know what to do in a crisis, let that gift of wisdom rest. Come on, just receive that right now. Father, anoint our minds for creativity and for focus, Lord. Take your hands and just put them over your heart for one moment, if you would. And Father, I pray today in Jesus' name that you would anoint our hearts to believe that our situation can change and that our situation will change as we take initiative and we step forward. Father, I pray that you'd release the gift of faith. Lord, I pray that you'd enable your people to believe for extraordinary things. This is not the way your story ends. This famine, it shall pass. God will come to the aid of his people. Father, we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, give him one last big praise in this place. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. God bless you, everybody. This is going to be our benediction. In just one moment, I want you to hug five people, and I want you to prophesy over them and tell them that open doors are coming. I want you to remember Wednesday evening, we're to be here for a fresh look at giving yourself to Jesus. And next Saturday night, be here next Saturday night, 530 for Canon.